Hello and welcome back to LMU History Department's Summer Web Social Media Series, Viral Histories, a series of conversations about all things health and disease. I'm joined today again by my colleague, Professor Carla Biddle. Carla started off our series with a discussion of the 1918 influenza uh, pandemic and beyond, thinking beyond the flu. Uh, she's back today to talk about the plague and the famous image of the plague doctor. So welcome, Carla. Thanks for having me. Carla, you are a historian of the 19th century and largely teach about the modern period. So how did you get interested in the plague and the plague doctor? Well, I'm not a medievalist and I'm nor am I an early modernist, but I have learned a great deal from those historians. And I, my course on the history of health and disease mostly focuses on North America and mostly after the 18th century, which is mostly after the plague eras. Um, but I have always felt like the history of plague kind of haunts that class, right? It's in the like the immediate kind of shadows of that class and the historical memory of disease that um, emerges in the 19th century and in, in our own time is really connected, I think, to, to the history of plague. Uh, and students are really fascinating with plague um, and fascinated with this image of the plague doctor, um, asking me often about the costume and the costume, um, which originates in the early modern period, I have to remind them, not, not the era of the Black Death and the medieval, medieval period. So um, that costume, which I'm sure we'll talk about, but it, you know, is this long leather coat. It has, you know, it's this image of a um, physician wearing a long leather coat and wide brimmed hat, um, gloves, and this signature mask, right? A mask that is kind of bird-like and um, with a kind of huge beak and um, said to have all kinds of aromatics in it, herbs, spices, things to block out the bad, the bad vapors. So, this costume, I think, has kind of taken on a life of its own, <laughs> especially lately. Um, the image of it, you know, are proliferating the internet even before the pandemic, and that's why I've talked to students about it, but now um, it's a Halloween costume, it's part of a video game, it's been picked up by steampunk culture, um, it, you know, has long been a kind of mask at Carnival in Venice, so um, so I, you know, students have been interested and I am too, and, but when I went to look at the sources, I realized that this history is much more complicated and I think much more interesting than we might think. So um, to get at some of those complications, plague can obviously refer to a lot of things. Um, what is it, what are we talking about when we talk about the plague and how should we understand that historically? Well. The history of the plague is, is vast and it covers centuries and it's also clearly a global history. Um, my focus is on the US and Europe, but, um, uh, and for that reason, that's, you know, where I'll, I'll, I'll what I'll talk about today, but it, it does have this, you know, I mean, it, it, there are scholars in many sort of with geographical, many geographical specialties that, that focus on it. Um, but plague often when people talk about it are referring historically to bubonic plague, uh, which is an infectious disease. Um, it's caused by the bacillus Yersinia pestis. Um, it is transported usually by fleas that move from rodent to rodent and then animals and humans. Um, and when someone is bit by one of those fleas, it can cause these pustules, um, and it can cause an infection that then moves to the lymph nodes um, where it also creates these large nodules, which are make the kind of signature um, uh, uh, image of the buboes, right, which are the nodules that form. Um, it also causes really severe, severe flu-like symptoms. And um, it, it was, you know, really, um, the mortality rate was very high at, at many points in history. 20% um, of cases when they reach the lungs um, can cause what's called pneumonic plague, which can then spread from person to person through air droplets. And you can see why that was you know, also um, very dangerous and the mortality rate was very high from that. And so that's what we think caused um, some of the major waves of plagues. Um, uh, so the, you know, the, if you kind of think of it in three waves, the first wave of plague was the, uh, the plague of Justinian, which had reached Constantinople in 542. Um, and then the second wave is what is the Black Death in the 14th century, which um, uh, um, 
came out of or was in Central Asia, uh, reached Constantinople, the Mediterranean. And um, we, well, for a while, historians debated sort of, and, you know, I think uh, debated sort of what, what the cause of, what, of that was and what the pathogen was. It's now pretty clear that it was Yersinia pestis. Um, and historians have been using, you know, the biology and genetic information coming from the remains of people who we believe died of plague. And now that the full genome of the bacillus has, has been outlined, um, we can really kind of make those connections and they're using you know, biology to, to confirm that. So following the medieval period, there were a series of more localized outbreaks of plague in early modern Europe. In the 17th century, there were outbreaks in Paris, Milan, Genoa, Naples, and in 1665, the Great Plague of London. And then as late as 1720, one in Marseille. It's these 17th century plagues that I will mostly be discussing today as we examine the image of the plague doctor. But I think it's important to note that there was a third pandemic wave of plague starting in the 19th century in China, spreading to Hong Kong, and from there on to ports all over the world. It was especially devastating in India, killing millions. It reached San Francisco in 1899, 1900, where it became associated with its Chinatown during the time when anti-Chinese racism was running high. And then there were a series of relatively smaller outbreaks of plague um, that followed into the 1920s. So that's really the long history of plague, as historians describe it. Today, plague is pretty rare and it's pretty treatable with antibiotics, thankfully. Um, the CDC reports about seven cases on average of human plague per year, mostly in the Southwest. And the WHO reports about 1,000 to 2,000 cases a year worldwide. It's, it's one of those things that we don't think of as still being around in some ways, but yet it's still here with us. Yes. So we obviously have a very different understanding of disease from people in the medieval and early modern periods. How did uh, people in those periods historically explain the source of the plague? How did they understand illness more generally? Well, you know, I think it's, it's such an interesting question because there are many interpretations and it's kind of hard to, you know, um, it's 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 not just one explanation, but there are you know some I think um, important ones that stand out, and you know there were religious explanations, but then there were also explanations that really focused on the body. So in terms of the religious explanations, there was you know the notion that plague was a result of God's punishment, um, that it came for often from sins like communal or collective sins of a society. Um, or individual sinful living. So there are these kind of religious explanations, but then there were also explanations, again, focused on the body, like, um, and based on humoral theory. For a very long time, the notion of the humors, which was um, articulated by the ancient physician Galen, um, Greek physician Galen, um, he and others described that health was maintained by a balance of four humors in the body, um, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. And when those came out of were out of balance, um, that's often what led to disease. And rebalance happened through um, different types of interventions like bleeding and purging, vomiting, sweating, et cetera. So these kind of more dramatic interventions. Um, a poor humoral state could predispose you to plague. And so um, many believed. Um, and again, there were a lot of conflicting theories, but um, just in, in terms of some of the most common. Um, but they also said, many people said that you acquired plague from both people and from the environment. Um, and they described plague as kind of resulting at, in a kind of poisoning of the humors which then the humors themselves also needed to be restored. And so some of those things I mentioned, like the bleeding and the purging were often uh, solutions to plague. Um, but it was the idea that plague also, you know, caused, um, uh, was caused by poisonous air or it came from poisonous air, I should mention. And, you know, the, the term poison is often used to describe it and it's kind of poisoning of the body or corruption of the body. Um, but the poisonous air is related to what's known as miasma theory, 
And miasma theory is the idea that disease resulted from bad air itself. Um, from, and what they meant by that was from, often from decomposition or rotting material, dead animals, human waste, um, rotting food, the stench of crowded cities. They would often describe miasma as the quote, filthy vapors. Um, and because of that it was often associated with cities and often associated with poor living conditions. Um, and so often when plagues came, those who could afford it would try to flee the cities. And those who stayed um, were often, you know, those who, you know, were, were more in, in, likely to be impoverished. And unfortunately, they kind of became, so they were the ones who suffered the most and then became associated with the disease itself. So there was a lot of kind of scapegoating and associating um, at the time. That's so very interesting when we think about, um, you know, some of the ways we see the kind of uh, similar dynamics happening today um, around wealth and the ability to, to flee places where there are uh, disease. Um, and it, it also speaks to just how revolutionary uh, the developments in 19th century medicine uh, were with the, the development of the germ theory. Mm -hmm. So who was the plague doctor? Uh, and uh, how was that doctor treating the plague at this point in time? So while there is a popular image of the plague doctor, treatment for plague came from a variety of sources, as did all kind of healing um, in the early modern period. And so, you know, a couple important points to think about in terms of healing and practitioners, which is that um, some historians describe this as a, quote, medical marketplace of healing, because there were many options, and often your economic status would shape kind of who you could see and, and um, were part of shaping that marketplace. Um, but it's important to note that there were a variety of different uh, remedies and actors you might seek help from. And the line between someone who was labeled a quack and a quote physician was often could be blurrier than you might expect as well. Um, and also a lot of healing, especially for plague, um, happened in the household. And um, I'm, you know, I want to talk about all the practitioners that are kind of whose occupations are surrounding healing. But for um, individuals and families, they first turn to you know the household and and help, and often that was involved with 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 women, right, doing a lot of the healing at the at the bedside. So outside the home, you would have a variety of, of, of um, people you could turn to. So the physicians, for example, um, were those who were trained doctors, but they were trained theoretically, often by reading uh, medical texts. Um, and they were, um, you know, they would have kind of been, they considered themselves kind of at the top of the of the healing pyramid. Um, then there were also apothecaries who prepared and dispensed medicines. There were surgeons. Um, they were the ones who had the knives and the tools. Um, you could also go to a medical astrologer, which was really important to medicine for a very long time, um, who would produce these almanacs who, you know, where they would try to predict when plague might come and, and would also offer um, uh, different types of solutions. Um, there were midwives, of course, and other women healers. Um, some of these women healers were called wise women. Sometimes they were called white witches. <laughs> um, so there were kind of these, uh, uh, there was a, you know, a variety of, of women who were actually involved, especially with, with um, around caring for the plague. So um, one historian has talked about a group called which I find really interesting, which is the searchers of the dead. And this historian has described the you know, women in communities who would examine bodies for signs of plague. So they would go into households that where plague was suspected, which was really dangerous for them, of course, and they would kind of determine if sick people in the home or people who had died in the home um, had signs of plague. And this was used to determine things like quarantine and, and um, kind of the way in which a community managed the disease itself. And um, historians talk about how they've kind of been left out of the picture. 
So um, there were also, I'll just call them a variety of potion dealers, like these popular healers who sold a bunch of antidotes. Um, they sold herbal plasters. Um, they did all, they, and you know, some were kind of um, seen as more legitimate than others, but people at times were willing to try, again, different types of things to solve which, you know, a, an illness that seemed, you know, at times insurmountable. Um, they would also turn to, you know, faith, right, and faith healing, and they saw, they saw the intervention of God as a really, you know, important piece of it. Um, but again, you know, it often started in the home, and that's often, I think, what kind of gets left out is the plague doctor becomes this kind of figure um, that, that dominates our imagination about the plague. And then there were um, a series of, of treatments, right, um, and the, you know, that were a variety of different kinds of treatments, but the goal of the treatments was to draw out the poison, right? So the idea was often to provide antidotes to the poisons, like things people called plague waters or plague powders. Um, they also tried to break and drain the buboes themselves by softening them with the plaster, or they used, they thought that onions might draw out the poison, um, and they used kind of lancets to cut and then cut them out. So um, there were, you know, kind of these surgical interventions, topical interventions, and then also these, these antidotes. But the other thing people did, and this might sound familiar, is, you know, is, is kind of acts of prevention, where they would do lots of, while they didn't understand it as, as bacteria, right, they would clean private spaces, clean the home, clean clothes, um, they would also clean up the bad air by burning things like herbs and wood and tar, frankincense, these things to kind of mask and intervene with, with the noxious air. Um, they also uh, would do things like stuff their nose with herbs or hold herbs near their face. And again, that kind of translates to the plague doctor mask. Um, they would also, um, it's said, you know, suck on cloves and garlic. So there were all these ways of kind of trying to intervene with the miasma and in an effort to kind of protect yourself from plague. I, I always end up thinking of um, the, what you see today often in terms of aromatherapy um, and how uh, making smells smell better uh, can make us feel better. Um, but you talked about what I find so interesting about this is the the wide variety of treatments and the wide variety of medical practitioners involved, but yet we fixated on this image of the doctor, um, and in part, in large part at least, it seems because of the costume. So, what's in a beak? Why did plague doctors wear such an unusual costume, or how has that become what we think of in terms of the plague doctor costume? Well, it's. It's, it's really interesting because, again, the kind of the characteristics of it, the leather coat, the wide brim hat, the, the beaked mask, and again, that mask idea, we think, was that it would be filled with these like better smells, right, that would block the inhalation from, of the bad air. Um, some of them are portrayed with long sticks to kind of keep people at a distance, often kind of prodding them, I think, in, in popular imagery. Um, but the historical problem, you know, there's an interesting historical problem that comes in when you try to sort out these images and the engravings. And what we have is very short observations by observers with actual practices. And the history of practice, of course, is really important to the history of medicine and the history of science. And so a lot of people are trying to kind of understand this. And the plague doctor is certainly part of our iconography of plague and our historical imagination of plague. But how often this, this costume um, was worn is, a, is also a different issue that I think is still being sorted out. Um, and the costume, I mean, the history that we, we do have is that it's attributed to um, the French plagues and a physician named um, Charles de Lorme um, in around 1619. And he was a uh, physician to Louis XIII and to other French royalty as well. And so um, we think that, you know, there's French sources that describe him years later, actually, in this outfit, right, which where he's covered from head to toe and he's wearing a leather coat and he's wearing some kind of mask with a long nose. 
Um, and then there are kind of other sources that come after it that describe doctors in Rome um, wearing a mask. Um, again, observations, kind of these short observations, and then they, these portrayals and these engravings. Um, and then we come to one of the most famous images, which I think um, you're showing, which is um, uh, the Paolo's first um, Dr. Vicky from Rome, um, which is from 1656. And uh, this one, historians think, is largely satirical because there's these added elements like claw gloves and this rod that has bats wings on it <laughs> with an hourglass um and so and it seems like people are running from him in the background right and um historians um uh like Kathy Crowther and others they talk about you know the 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 actual text that's woven into the image too which includes verses about how these doctors are preying on dying patients and they're just trying to eat out a living and people again um, need to kind of be warned about them so so that image i think now that again is all over the internet we're kind of have to be you know criti critically analyze it for where it might come from and what it's trying to say about italian doctors um and then you know there are also later depictions from 1720 or so um and in a plague treatise so we have these kind of again these engravings that are these striking images of these plague doctors um but we we don't have as much about like how many doctors actually wore these and and how widely this was practiced. And there's a lot of historians who are really kind of questioning like how, you know, how big of a phenomenon this was, or is it kind of part of our historical imagination? So we're left with this fascinating, I think, historical problem of imagery versus practice. And we know there were many different kinds of healers. So why then do we care so much about Dr. Beek? Yeah, so, so what do you think's at work there? I mean, there's so much interest in the, the history of the plague um, today. Um, the, as you mentioned, the image of the plague doctor is certainly circulating a lot on, online. Um, why do you think there's so much interest in the plague and the plague doctor today? Well, I think there's, you know, no doubt in our own moment of pandemic um, that we are, you know, reaching into history, right, to make connections and make sense of, of what's going on. And here we have this kind of symbol, it seems, from the 17th century plagues um, of, this, of this physician. Um, people have said it's the PPE, right, of the, <laughs> of the plague era. So there's these kind of, you know, comparisons that are being made. Um, I think it's, you know, no doubt that the costume and the mask are intriguing, right? They are... Um, they are creepy. Um, they kind of, I think, merge current interests in the Gothic um, with things like dark tourism. Um, you know, I was in Edinburgh one Halloween <laughs> doing research, and there were people in a lot of these costumes, right? And it, it's it's kind of becomes associated with these plague histories in different cities. Um, but I also think, you know, it's a material symbol um, of a past that I think some want to see as archaic and, you know, to kind of see, like to kind of confirm the progress of our own time and kind of look to this kind of strange past, right? Um, and then, it, and which I would be critical of that, that view, but there, I think that's kind of what's happening in some discussions. But I also think it's interesting that much like 1918 and the influenza pandemic, which we talked about before, um, media sources, um, also are kind of using the plague doctor and kind of making direct comparisons and relations with our own time, saying, look, you know, again, here's the PPE of the plague era, right? You know, they kept making these kind of um, analogies and connections across time. So I think it's really interesting how we disassociate ourselves from the past at times, and then we seem to easily liken the present to it as well, sometimes, again, both uncritically and as we try to make sense of where we are today. So I think, you know, this is where the, you know, the training in history um, that we try to share with our students, right, in our courses of kind of thinking critically about these primary sources in the past and the kind of life that they seem to take on, especially in our own media age, and um, to kind of provide perspective on that. 
Right, and the idea that um, the emphasis on wanting to make sure that history doesn't get flattened so much. I mean, I think that's really interesting what you were saying about in terms of wanting to distance ourselves from the past, but also to make these very simple analogies. And one of the things that we always want our students to do is embrace that complexity and, and the complications of the past. Um, I'm, I'm showing right now a, an image of, uh, a, that was circulating on, on social media of the summer 2020 costume, which is the plague doctor, but with all of these, the accoutrements of the costume um, reinterpreted in light of our, our current moment. Uh, and that speaks, I think, to the way in which this, uh, the image has resonated in, in different ways. And it's again just kind of seems to have taken on a life of life of its own, especially lately. And um, there are a lot of historians who are also, you know, really trying to sort through this and where where this kind of historical memory has come from. Um, but recently, it's it's become as you like as you see with that image, you know, something that we see ourselves in somehow, but also you know see as part of another time. So it's interesting, right? Well, thank you so much, Carla, for giving us a lot of the history behind the, the popular image. I very much appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's really fun. Yeah. Uh, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. Come back next week when Professor Amy Woodson Bolton will be here to talk about COVID, wild animals, and environmental history. See you then, and wear your masks.